Hey, it's Rob West. Before we get to the podcast, did you know that the MoneyWise app is an organized way for married couples to manage their finances and plan for future goals together? You can choose from one of three options depending on your management style, and it's available in both desktop and mobile versions. You can get this great biblical money management solution by going to moneywise.org and clicking the Manage tab. Now, here's the podcast. To win at any game, you first have to know the rules. That's true for everything from Monopoly to your 401k. Hi, I'm Rob West. Well, managing your 401k is certainly no game. It's serious business. But there's a little known rule about your 401k that could be a real blessing in a financial crisis. I'll explain today, and then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is MoneyWise, biblical wisdom for your financial decisions. Okay, if you have a 401k retirement plan, you know it's filled with rules that most people aren't fond of, but the one we're talking about today is an exception. It's the so-called Rule of 55. Normally, you're not allowed to withdraw money from your 401k without incurring a 10% penalty until you reach age 59 and a half. But the Rule of 55 is a special IRS provision that waives the penalty once you reach 55 or older. Uh, By the way, the rule of 55 also applies to 403B retirement accounts. That's the equivalent plan for nonprofit organizations. Now, how does it work? Well, it only applies in a few specific conditions. For example, if you're 55 or older and leave your job, you can withdraw funds without the penalty. But you can't take advantage of the rule if you're still working at the company where you have the 401k or 403B. And you have to leave that job in the calendar year you turn 55 or later to get a penalty-free distribution. But if you're a public safety worker, such as a police officer, firefighter, or even air traffic controller, the rule actually kicks in at age 50. If you lose or leave your job before the eligible age, you miss out on the rule entirely. Uh, You won't be able to take a penalty-free withdrawal until you reach the usual age of 59 and a half. And as with all exceptions to the 10% penalty, the rule of 55 still has tax implications. It doesn't get you out of paying taxes on your withdrawals, which are considered income on your federal return, and probably your state return if your state has an income tax. I know all of that can be confusing, so maybe it would be easier to talk about when the rule doesn't apply. Uh, For starters, it doesn't apply to retirement plans from previous employers. It has to be the 401k at your current or latest job to be eligible. Also, it doesn't apply to individual retirement accounts, either a traditional or a Roth IRA. For those, you'd still have to be 59 and a half before making penalty-free withdrawals. However, there's a way around the provision that excludes previous 401k or 403b accounts. You can roll those funds over from a previous account to your current one if your employer accepts rollovers. Not all do, so check with your HR department to find out. Then, once you've completed the rollover, all of the money in your current account, including the transferred amount, will be available if you make an early withdrawal under the Rule of 55. But of course, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. In almost all cases, tapping into your 401k is not advisable because you're essentially robbing your future and giving up not just the money, but the time you've invested in building up those funds. You may be able to replace the funds eventually, but you can never get back the time, which is critical for long-term compounding gains in your portfolio. You're essentially starting over, but with less time before retirement. So you want to avoid early withdrawals, if at all possible, even if you can do it without the 10% penalty under the Rule of 55. Proverbs 13.11 teaches, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. 
Okay, so when would it be okay to take an early withdrawal from a 401k? Well, only if you simply have no other choice. Remember, you can only use the rule of 55 if you're no longer with the employer where you had the account. In some cases, that probably means you've lost your job or a significant part of your income due to your hours being cut. But even then, you should delay as long as possible before making an early withdrawal from your 401k. You can use the Mayday budget available at moneywise.org. It'll help you prioritize your spending, and we'll put a link to that in today's show notes. And keep in mind that you should have an adequate emergency fund of three to six months living expenses saved up before financial calamity strikes, and you want to exhaust that before making a withdrawal from your 401k or 403b. All right, your calls are next, 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. You can call that 24-7. I'm Rob West, and this is Money Wise. For a few more days at least, and then we'll have a brand new name to ring in the new year. Do you ever feel stressed or anxious about money? If so, that's normal, but you don't have to accept that you can find peace of mind and financial security. Learn how with the 31-day devotional, Money Seeking God's Wisdom. You'll find powerful scripture and practical exercises for spiritual and financial growth. You can request your copy with a gift of any amount. Would you consider a monthly or one-time gift by December 31st? Just visit moneywise.org give. What if buying groceries, gas, or dining out could help change lives? With Christian Community Credit Union's Cards That Give to Missions, you can help spread the gospel, combat human trafficking, and protect vulnerable children with every purchase at no cost to you. Apply for your card today. More information is available at joinchristiancommunity.com. That's joinchristiancommunity.com. The Credit Union is an underwriter of this ministry. Membership eligibility required. Welcome back to Money Wise. I'm Rob West, your host. We've got a ton of questions lined up here, so let's head right back to the phones. To Wisconsin we go. Clint, you're next on the program, sir. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. I have kind of a unique question, I guess. Um, I just recently sold my primary residence um, that had a mother-in-law suite in the back that I rented out the whole time that I lived there. And from everything that I have researched. Um, I wouldn't pay capital gains on that, but when I sold the house, they had me check the box of a 1099 form because it was like I had a business because I made profit off of that rent, obviously. So I was just trying to bounce that off of you to see if you think I'll pay capital gains on that or not because it was my primary residence and it was under 500000 yeah, that's exactly right. So normally if that would be your your primary residence, you can exclude as a married couple up to 250 or 500,000 for a married couple. Uh, the question would be whether this portion of the property, because it would be seen as an investment, um, you know, could that be excluded from this exclusion, so to speak? And uh, I'm not, um, that's a good question. I would talk to a CPA or accountant about that. So you did collect uh, rent on that. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Yeah. And so I suspect that portion of it may be excluded, but I'm not uh, exactly certain on that, Clint. Uh, Have you consulted with a CPA or accountant on this? No, I have not yet. I just uh, sold a a week and a half ago, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, So I would definitely check that one out. I mean, clearly the portion that was your domicile and considered your primary residence, that would uh, apply here. The question is whether there would be a carve out for the portion of this sale that was an income generating property that happened to be on the same parcel of land. Was it detached from your uh, parcel, your home? It is detached, but it's the same uh, tax key. So that's that's kind of why I'm it's kind of convoluted because I don't know how they'll be able to separate that being that it's on a separate tax key. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. So that, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, I, I don't have a clear answer for you on that, but it's one I'm glad you're checking into because the last thing you'd want would be for that to be a surprise later. If you try to roll all of that in and then you were audited on that and, and found out that that was excluded. So I would uh, make this a year where if you normally do your taxes, you're getting some professional guidance on this uh, just to be clear as to whether that mother-in-law suite uh, as an income generating property, 
is not subject to that uh, exclusion. Uh, let us know what you find out, Clint. I'd be curious to know kind of where that one settles out. Thanks for checking with us today. I'm sorry I don't have a definitive answer for you. Uh, to Cleveland, Ohio, WCRF. Sharon, go right ahead. Oh, yes. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I have sure. a life insurance uh, worth $10,000, and I've had it for years. I just um, changed it over to a permanent life, and I'm finding out that it doesn't have any value. And I want to stop uh, payment. I mean, because um, it's not doing me any good. And yes. just continually to pay into it. And I know I've invested more than $10,000 all these years. Yeah. So is there anything that you can suggest that I could do other than stop paying it? There really isn't. Uh, I would probably just drop it. Do you need a death benefit at this point? Is there somebody counting on you for your income that you're providing that at your death would create a hardship for them? No. Okay. So this, who was the beneficiary of this uh, policy? Oh, uh, my son was. I okay. mean, he is. Okay. And so, um, you know, obviously this is not something he's counting on, and you're not looking at this for burial expenses or anything like that? No, uh-uh, not at all. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so unfortunately, if there's not, I mean, there, if there's a cash value, you'd want to take that out and just recognize there may be a portion of that that's taxable. But if they're saying there is no cash value, then essentially you're just paying to fund the death benefit and at that uh, nominal amount of death benefit, um, you know, it's going to get more and more costly over time. So as much as you'd hate to walk away from all the money you've put into that, I think the only thing worse than that is just continuing to pay on it, given that there's not really a need for it. And you can reclaim that monthly premium or semi-annual premium back in your budget and redirect that to other purposes. Yes, yes. That, that was what I was thinking that I should do. Now, I have one other question about transferring okay. my home for my son. How, what's the best way to do that? I mean, I have it in my will, but yes. then if I want to transfer it for it to him before then, it, what's the yeah. best way to do that? Uh, what would be the purpose for that in your mind, Sharon? Why would you try to transfer it prior to your death? Um, because I'm, I'm, well, he'll probably live in it, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. And I, I'm just kind of done with dealing with the property. I see. Yeah, the only downside to that is, I mean, you could quit claim deed that to him. So it would be essentially a gift to him. Then you'd have to let the IRS know that you made that gift to him, which is not a problem because you have a lifetime uh, gift exclusion of up to $12 million that you can give away as a gift before it, there's any kind of gift tax. So that's fine. The downside, though, is that there's not what's called a stepped up basis for tap, tax purposes for capital gains. So if he receives it as a part of an inheritance because you pass away and his your will says that he inherits the house, then the, the cost basis for the house for con calculating the capital gain is stepped up to the date of your death. So whatever the value of the home is at the date of your death, that's now the new cost basis. And then if he turns around and sells it, uh, the gain would be calculated from that point uh, forward. The, if you quit claim deed it to him, then he gets your cost basis, the amount that you purchased it for. And then when he goes to sell it down the road, all of that gain from the what you paid for it to what he sells it for, minus any improvements that have been made to it, is going to be uh, taxable as a capital gain. So from a tax standpoint, it's, it's not really very favorable at all. In fact, there's a lot of reasons not to do that, uh, unless there was some other reason that you just absolutely want him to uh, have the home in his name prior to your death. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. Okay. So it's better not to quit claim. It is. It's better for you to hang on to it if you want to let him live there rent free. And even if he wants to pay the taxes and the insurance for you, you do that. But in terms of him actually taking title to the property and being on the deed, I would let that happen as an inheritance so we get the benefit of the stepped up basis. Thanks for your call today. Quickly to Illinois before our next break. Sarah, how can I help you? Uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm calling because uh, I'm on. Uh, I receive disability payments, and um, 
Uh, I receive a certain amount every month. And now I'm returning, I've returned to work part time and I don't make a lot. I don't make over the amount they said I can make. Um, and I was wondering, now that I'm working part time and they're taking out taxes or whatever, will this eventually allow, would this cause my Social Security payments to go up? In other words, yeah, can I yeah. earn new Social Security points? Uh, what have you? You can. There's two ways for your Social Security payment to increase. One is a cost of living adjustment every year pegged to inflation once you begin collecting benefits. The second is if you continue working or return to work as you've done and you earn more in a year than you earned in any of your previous high 35 years, which is how they calculate your benefit, the highest 35 years of earnings. If any of these new years replace one of those, well, that will increase your benefit. And this happens regardless of your age. So you absolutely will benefit if you're earning more. This is Money Wise. For a bit longer anyway, we'll change our name in the new year. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. God's word is packed with life-changing wisdom about your finances. And Money Wise is here to help you and millions of others learn to be wise stewards. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on help from Money Wise patrons, supporters of this mission, to help us continue and expand our outreach. Has God provided financial answers for you through this ministry? If so, please consider becoming a monthly Money Wise patron. Visit MoneyWise.org and click Give on the homepage. We are grateful for support from Praxis Mutual Funds. Praxis Mutual Funds has seven impact strategies that are designed to create positive real-world change. More information is available at PraxisMutualFunds.com. The fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses are contained in the prospectus and summary prospectus. This and other information is available at PraxisMutualFunds.com. Investments involve risk. Principal loss is possible. Foreside Fund Services, LLC. Welcome back to Money Wise. I'm Rob West, your host. Let's take a quick email. This one comes to us from Julie. This is a tough one. She says, I co-signed a $30,000 loan for my son. He's not making the payments. In fact, he no longer talks to me. He's changed his name. How can I get my name off the loan and not be a co-signer anymore? And Julie, I wish I had good news for you. Number one, you know, this is really why the Bible is so clear we shouldn't co-sign. And I realize, uh, you know, that's easier said than done. And uh, we can't go back and change that. Uh, but unfortunately, there is no simple way to have your name removed from the loan. He would have to either uh, requalify for a new loan, depending on what type of loan it is, without you, which obviously if there's a strained relationship, he's not talking to you. Uh, it sounds like he's probably not going to be willing to do that. Uh, or if there's an asset that has collateralized this loan uh, because he's no longer paying, if you could somehow get him to turn the asset over to you. So for example, if it was for an automobile or some other tangible property and he signed it over to you, then you could either keep it and use it or sell it and then use the sale to satisfy the loan. And you may have to come out of pocket for uh, the difference between the value of the asset and the balance on the loan. But unfortunately, given this relationship um, and the relationship's already strained, but there's going to be a negative impact on your credit report if you don't continue to pay it. So again, uh, this happens in 50% of the cases when we co-sign for someone, according to the Federal Trade Commission, and it's why we should just stay away. So uh, let's pray that, uh, Julie, you can get that relationship restored, get back on good terms, not for the financial reasons, but just relationally first. But then secondly, once that's done, Done, Lord willing, um, you can either get him to uh, take ownership of this and resume payments or turn the asset over to you if there is one. Um, I know this is a tough one, so you hang in there and we'll pray the Lord gives you some wisdom on navigating this. Thanks for writing to us. If you have a question for us, send it along to questions at moneywise.org. All right, back to the phones we go to Miami Beach, Florida. Hey, Lewis, go right ahead. Yes. Thank you for taking my call, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I'm calling because I have a question concerning uh, jewelry. I used to have a business, jewelry business. I'm a designer, but I have brain aneurysm, so I'm disabled now. And I've been trying to market it through eBay, 
but my wife and I were not very good on the computer, so I haven't been able to do much about that. So the question is, if I call a kingdom advisor in the area, do you think that they could help me to see if I can get somebody, uh, and if I give a commission, because it's, it's a substantial amount of jewelry that I have, probably a couple mm-hmm. hundred thousand dollars or more. And for a commission, a good commission that I will give, if there will be anybody interested to help uh, help me to market it to eBay. I see. You know, a Kingdom Advisor probably would not be the place to go. And this is going to be challenging, uh, Lewis, uh, because you've got to find somebody that really wants to go into business with you, in a sense, and put in their time to work alongside you, essentially as a partner, uh, to, you know, learn the uh, ins and outs of marketing uh, this jewelry. You obviously have the know-how uh, with regard to being a jeweler and uh, evaluating and appraising these particular pieces and so forth. You understand what you have. What you need is somebody who's uh, technologically savvy um, that can help you, as you said, market and essentially create a business online with jewelry, which is very challenging because without a, a really solid reputation online, people are very leery of buying jewelry over the internet uh, just because they don't know who they're buying it from and what kind of quality um, pieces are they going to receive. Um, have you considered uh, perhaps um, you know going to work for a jeweler uh, and as a part of that, maybe selling the uh, the pieces that you have uh, to you know convert those to cash. You could invest that, and then take these skills that God has given you as a jeweler and the interest in that area, and you know go work for somebody who will pay you a salary. Have you considered that? Well, this is a situation. I became disabled through aneurysm, so I cannot uh, work as a jeweler anymore. You know, my my eyes has been affected because of the surgery that I have. I see. So I lost all of that. But in any yeah. case, I was wondering whether yeah. a kingdom advisor would be, you know, probably yeah. further. I don't think so. Advising. Let me let me throw one other. Uh, that would not really be in the typical skill set of an advisor. They're really to advise on financial matters. Uh, I'd love for you to check out an organization called SCORE. It's the Service Corps of uh, Retired Executives. And um, that would allow you to perhaps be connected to a business mentor. Uh, you'll find them on the web, Lewis, at score.org. That's S-C-O-R-E dot O-R-G. Perhaps a business mentor could be someone who could help you in this situation. Again, it's not going to be easy just for the reasons that I mentioned. But let's just pray that the Lord brings the right person along to either help you get this up and running and, and help you manage it as a partner or just to help you liquidate all of these assets and convert that to cash so that it can be invested and perhaps generate a passive income stream for you. And once you sell them, if you have a couple of hundred thousand dollars now in cash, well, that's where a certified kingdom advisor could be very helpful in helping you uh, invest that. Lewis, all the best to you. Thanks for calling today, sir. God bless you. William, you'll be our final caller today in Tennessee. Go ahead, sir. How are you doing today, sir? I'm well, thank you. I just have about a minute left. How can I help? Yes, sir. Actually, I heard uh, oh, heard you talking to one gentleman. It was about uh, uh, Social Security. And you mentioned yes, to him that if, uh, if he had already uh, was old enough, he could re- they would return some money that he was uh, trying to get a family in all that. You mentioned something on that line. Yes. Yeah, let me explain what I was talking about there, William. Essentially, um, prior to full retirement age, if you start taking your Social Security benefits, and you can do that at 62 instead of 66 or 67, and you'll have about a 30% reduction. But if you start taking Social Security benefits prior uh, to reaching full retirement age, then they will reduce your benefits $1.00. For every $2 you earn above $19,560. So if you continue to work and earn above that, uh, they'll reduce your benefit $1 for every $2 you earn above that. And they will continue to do so until you reach full retirement age and then you'll get your full benefit. 
But in addition to that, they will add something on top of your full benefit to begin to repay you for the amount that it was reduced by until it's fully paid back, but it could take years. Uh, so eventually you'll get all that money back. Um, it's just going to take a little bit of time for them to uh, pay that back to you in the form of a higher check. So hopefully that helps you, William. Thanks for listening and calling today, sir. That's going to do it for us today. Thank you to Luke Castaldo, Gabby T., Amy Rios, and Jim Henry. Thank you for being here as well. Hope you have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Money Wise is provided by Money Wise Media and listeners like you.